Oh, yes, David woke we'll up with this shakes this morning, so she'll probably be in this evening. She, overall, she's been doing better. Well, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Did they ever find out what exactly happened? Well, her adrenals are messed up. <laughs> uh, they're producing too much cortisol at night, so she can't rest. And, and it's messing up her water management, minerals, everything else. Then, so in the morning, she doesn't have higher cortisol. She has enough. So we're trying to figure out how to fix that. Hey, how are you? I told her we just, we just move. Yeah. Halfway around the world, then she'll be on schedule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 South America. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is what we've been looking at here. Look, this last week or so. I'm <laughs> saying just study up here. Thank you. Morning, Jack. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you guys? Okay. Hi, lady. Good morning. Good morning. Well, this way I can see. I can see him. So you see oh, there? Okay. That way I can see him. Not that way I won't be going like this. Okay. Well, somebody really, really tall. We're not mad. We're just letting you see. Yeah, yeah. You're just being polite. Anybody need a copy of our outline, textual criticism? We began looking at last week and um, probably finish it up here today. <clears throat> and specifically looking at some of these textual variations, how they took place uh, under the heading of unintentional variations and also what appears to be some intentional variations. We made mention in our study uh, last week that uh, those who are actual critics of the Bible will go around claiming, oh, there's 200,000 errors in the New Testament alone, and therefore there's just simply no way in the world that we can trust that we have before us uh, in actuality what was written by the original authors of the New Testament. Uh, but we broke that down uh, in our uh, studies. Uh, for example, you're talking about just by manuscripts alone, some 5,700 manuscripts, but uh, this also comprises you know, those that are uh, textual, uh, uh, in, the, in the field of textual criticism, involves uh, not only those 5,700 manuscripts, but uh, also the quotations by early church fathers and uh, also the other uh, evidences that we have of the New Testament that are out there besides just those manuscripts. But just, just take the manuscripts alone uh, and you divide 5,700 into 200,000, you're down to 35 per manuscript. It becomes a very small uh, number indeed on on things. And what we'll be looking at too is something we referred to last time. Some of these uh, so-called errors are uh, just uh, very, very minor, like uh, one manuscript may read Jesus and another manuscript reads Jesus Christ. Or there may be 20 manuscripts that read Jesus Christ and one reads Jesus. That's counted as 20 errors by these uh, people who are trying to uh, disparage your faith or belief in this being uh, in God's Word and you just take that times the many other s uh, situations like that. So that's where we're at in our studies here this morning. Cal, you want a word of prayer here this morning? We'll begin. Okay, Father, thank you for having us heard our lives so we can come together again to worship you and <clears throat> sing your songs of praises, to study your Word, to learn more about encourage each other in our lives. <clears throat> We're thankful for this opportunity to study your word and how it was delivered to us and how it was preserved so that we may refute the arguments of those who would disparage that word. Thankful for this teacher that we have. We ask that you bless him as he instructs us. We remember the things that he studied and presented well to us. Let us take them and examine them in the light of your word. That should be with those that are not here today, because of the of the Spirit. Give those courage that need courage and help restore those who are help who are sick. Ask you to continue to bless us and work with us. And we may be profitable service to you. Protect us always. In that great day, when you breath, gather all of yours together. Please gather us all about the loss of life. <coughs> In 
you'll see the term unintentional errors, and I made mention that last time. To me, errors kind of a misnomer. Uh, again, those that are actual critics of the Bible uh, refer to them as errors. They're variations in the readings, but the, it is the term, as I understand, the, uh, those that are in the science of textual criticism uh, use whenever they're looking at uh, these uh, so-called mis these mistakes that were uh, that do uh, the occur, and they are categorized in two different uh, areas in the copying process: unintentional uh, errors or variations, and intentional. We're going to look at both of those that are studies here this morning: intentional errors or uh, mistakes. Under the heading of unintentional uh, errors, made mention briefly at the close of our study. Uh, last uh, week that we're talking about mistakes of the hand, eye, ear, uh, these are frequent uh, in occurrence in the manuscripts, but uh, they usually pose no problem um, because they're rather easy to pick out by those that are uh, Bible scholars and uh, studying uh, these various uh, manuscripts. So we made mention that sometimes a scribe, a copyist uh, would uh, uh, with a copy before him uh, would make uh, mistakes of one word uh, by substituting that word for another unintentionally uh, or uh, he may see uh, the term uh, Lord here and then not record it over here uh, or uh, may see the term Lord on this line and put it on this line whenever he looks at it. In other words, they're just unintentional errors that uh, do occur just by looking at these type, uh, these type of things. Uh, the uh, textual critics, those that study it again, they uh, state that uh, even though there's um, a lot of these in the manuscripts that are available, they are very easily spotted and they're accounted for in one, one way or another. Uh, all they have to do is just compare uh, this manuscript with this manuscript and uh, others to detect and explain uh, these errors without hesitation. And it ought to be noted too that uh, though unintentional alterations of text are many, the vast majority of them are of very little consequence. Uh, some of them fall in the category of what we have up there, minor slips of the pen of the copyist. Uh, the text of an uncial manuscript contains all capital letters. We've talked about that before, with no spaces between the words and no punctuation. And um, I failed penmanship, and I think most people have seen me write before <laughs> can tell that I did. But I'm trying to illustrate what the copyist would see. Now, these are all English. <clears throat> words, uh, letters, uh, keep in mind they'd be seeing the Greek characters or the Hebrew characters if it was an Old Testament manuscript. And uh, what the textual critics uh, uh, account for is the difficulty of copying from these uncial manuscripts uh, because that's what they'd be looking at. All the letters running together so the copyist had to separate those out the best that he could. Also, as I understand, in these manuscripts, you might have a word like heaven. H-E-A uh, is on this line, and then V-E-N is on this line, and it's just constant that way. And the copyist has to see that and then write those things down. There's no punctuation uh, in any of these uncial manuscripts also. So uh, he'd have to be aware if there actually be, ought to be a pause by a comma someplace or another. They just don't appear in, the, in these manuscripts. And so this explains kind of the nature of the difficulties that a copyist actually uh, had and very easy to account for why they might want drop one letter, uh, interpose a couple of letters, uh, maybe repeat a line, uh, maybe even skip a line while they're uh, copying from these uh, manuscripts. But the majority of the supposed 200,000 mistakes of Greek manuscripts are, are just this kind of scribal <laughs> slips of of the pen. Again, these, these errors are, are, are very easily detected and corrected by the scholars who study the Greek text, the New Testament. Uh, they're easily corrected by comparison to other manuscripts. And, and important again to emphasize, they have absolutely no effect on the integrity of the Greek New Testament. Now this again is assurance that the biblical scholars are studying that 
uh, uh, firm, at least, in regard to this uh, study. Any uh, question or comments on what we're saying about the minor slips, the pen of the copyist here? Another uh, an unintentional variation occurs um, by small changes, uh, such as an article being added, you know, the or something being added, or a singular <coughs> being made plural, uh, all in attempts by a copyist to uh, improve the text. Uh, they still fall in the category of unintentional variations. Uh, things falling in this carrier uh, in this category of transposition of letters or words, omission of a word, uh, differences in uh, spelling of uh, words. Again, they have no effect on the meaning. Uh, if someone misspells a word in a sentence today in English, you can usually tell by the sentence what the word really was on things and now and they most of them could tell that just by looking at the word in a sentence uh, that uh, occurred or a paragraph uh, or they then could go to another manuscript and see the correct spelling of the word so it's easy again for them to make these uh, these corrections uh, others that fall in this uh, category of small uh, changes copyists trying to improve a text uh, might make two different accounts in the gospels identical uh, one example, uh, if uh, the Greek manuscripts exhibit two variant readings of a particular passage in Matthew, and if one of the two readings is identical to a parallel passage in Mark, the scholars uh, would lean toward using the reading of Matthew, which is different from that in Mark. Still, it's counted, though, uh, as uh, several uh, variant readings. Uh, and the scholars, they, uh, they approach it this way on the assumption that a scribe had tried to make the two passages identical uh, in, a, in an unfortunate but well-intentioned at least attempt to improve the text as he's copying it down. And another uh, category under unintentional errors is identified as uh, slight differences uh, uh, in the old manuscripts compared with later manuscripts. And we talked about this under the heading of manuscripts. That, uh, for example, the King James Version, 1611, whenever the committee gathered together for that, they only had one or two uh, noted codus, uh, codex manuscripts available. Uh, they didn't have the later ones uh, available. They weren't found yet or they weren't made available to uh, Bible scholars as of as of yet. And so then whenever uh, textual critics look at uh, the, the Greek text uh, in later years, like they did, for example, in 1901 for the American Standard Version, uh, they saw that there were differences in those older, uh, although they were newer finds, uh, those older manuscripts from the one that they had available whenever the King James Version 1611 uh, was uh, put together. Uh, just look at one example uh, here uh, to show you what we're talking about. Look at Matthew 11 and verse 19. Matthew 11 verse 19. And I don't know how many of you have footnotes in your Bibles, but a good bit of Bibles do have uh, very good footnotes. And I uh, just want to look at this passage as uh, one, uh, one slight difference uh, that is noted as a textual var variation by uh, those that study uh, in the field of textual criticism. Matthew 11 and verse 19. Uh, let's see, Mindy, if you're there, you want to read that for us? And, uh, what, what version are you using, by the way, you know? Let's see. NIV. NIV, okay. Let's see what it's it... It's got a T in front of it. I'm not sure what the T stands for. Okay. Anyway. All right. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners but wisdom is proved right by her actions. By your actions, all right. Uh, if you have a footnote in your Bible, uh, look around there, verse uh, 19's uh, footnote. Uh, mine uh, says, but wisdom is justified by her children, but the footnote says works. And some translations do, as this one says, uh, actions. Uh, there are two slightly different readings that are found in the Greek manuscripts uh, that the copyist would be copying. Uh, some end with the phrase, wisdom is proved right or justified by her children. That's the way some manuscripts read. Other manuscripts end with the phrase, wisdom is proved right or justified by her actions or by her works. 
In this case, the oldest and most reliable manuscripts, the uh, Vaticanus and the Sinai, have actions, uh, while most of the later manuscripts have children. Well, despite the fact that a majority of manuscripts have the alternate reading because the earliest manuscripts have actions, many English translations, later ones especially, use the word actions or works instead of deeds. children. I'm sorry? Or deeds. Deeds. Yeah. Right. Right. But there again, is there really a, is there a doctrinal change here? No, on things. Uh, even if you have children, you're still talking about the actions of the works of children uh, is what you're talking about, uh, not just the children per se on things. It's easy to understand, in other words, what's, what's going on. It's just one example that uh, falls under this category of slight differences uh, in older manuscripts compared with later manuscripts. Now the King James Version says children, but the, I mean the New King James Version. New King James Version is based upon uh, the, the manuscripts, the texts that were used in the, uh, the 1611 King James Version, so that's what, what it relies on. But see the New American Standard, New International Version, American Standard Version, uh, they had access to these, uh, these earlier manuscripts uh, than what the translators of the King James Version said, so then they changed it now to actions and, uh, or works instead of uh, children, like uh, the only manuscript basically had available at that time uh, was stating. Questions or comments on what we're saying here about these unintentional errors or variations in the text. Let's go on then to in, intentional uh, errors, intentional variations. And th this constitutes a more serious problem uh, because it does appear that some well-meaning scribes tried to correct what they perceived to be an error in a particular manuscript reading or something. Uh, when all the truly minor supposed mistakes though in a received Greek text the New Testament removed from constraints the student, the Bible left with only about a half a dozen of these variations in the Greek text. And uh, we're going to look at five, uh, six of those half a dozen here that are the most noted under this category of intentional errors. Uh, look first of all at John chapter 7, verse 53. <clears throat> and we won't read uh, all of the uh, text here. Uh, mainly want to look at John chapter 7 and verse 53 itself and again if you have a footnote that begins at that passage. Dear, you want to read John 7 verse 53 itself? Everyone went to his home. My uh, New King James Version at verse 53 has a number one which signifies there's a footnote uh, whenever you look down the line, this mind center column, <clears throat> and uh, it says uh, in one of these uh, manuscripts, brackets, uh, chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, verse 11, is not in the original text. They are present in over 900 manuscripts of John. Now keep in mind, uh, there may be some 5,000 manuscripts of the Gospel of John available out there, but... Uh, this passage from verse 53, chapter 7, through chapter 8, verse 11, does not appear, or does appear, uh, in only 900 of those. Uh, so here is uh, a, a definite variation uh, in, in translations that are out there. None of the earliest and most reliable versions include this passage. <laughs> It is probably a very early tradition of the primitive disciples, which was later inserted into uh, some of these uh, later 900 uh, manuscripts. Uh, almost certainly, though, it is a genuine story, um, but it was not part of the original book of John, the autograph copy of the book of John, according to what these textual critics of the Bible have uh, determined. But the passage again is not controversial because the story is so consistent with everything we know about Jesus. You know, what, he, what is recorded in chapter 8, verse 1 through verse 11, that woman taken in, uh, in the very act of adultery by these scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus, he's uh, writing on the ground and he's uh, condemning basically their actions and uh, basically said is that uh, they're in 
uh, verse 7, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her uh, first. So he's challenging their hypocrisy. And he does this in other places. Several other places Jesus challenges the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. He also uh, has teaching against hypocritical judging, which is actually what they're doing in this case also. They're just doing this test. Jesus is all they're doing. Uh, they're not really concerned about the woman. Uh, what about the man? <laughs> the man was involved too. They don't bring him. So they're totally hypocritical in what they're doing. So we have other teaching of Jesus uh, that conforms with the teaching that we have in this, in this passage. The teaching that's cited there of the old law, that she ought to be stoned. That's a true teaching, and it's recorded in the, in the old law. Uh, Jesus' uh, state, uh, statement here, uh, he who is without sin uh, among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Whenever uh, he says that, they all leave. Well, there's another Old Testament law that says things have to be confirmed by the mouth of two or three witnesses. There aren't any witnesses now. So that teaching, you see, is also in the New Testament teaching of Jesus. So everything in the account here uh, uh, can be confirmed as an authentic teaching of Jesus, even though it may not appear in many, many manuscripts. And the only reason why it does appear in sub 900 is because some scribe added it for some reason or another. Questions or comments on this one example here? Look at uh, Acts in chapter 8 and verse 37, and then we'll move to 1 John chapter 5 and verse uh, 7. First of all, Acts in chapter 8 and verse 37. Janice, you want to read that for us? See marginal note. And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, what Mark, translation are you reading from? New you know? American Standard. Okay, and see it. One, it says late manuscripts, insert verse 37. Right. So actually in the text, it doesn't have verse 37, does it? No. It just says, see the marginal note. And I don't know how many of you have those translations, but that's it. A, a lot of translations don't have verse 37 in there at all. And so sometimes whenever somebody's up here teaching, and uh, they, well, wait a minute now, <laughs> mine doesn't have that. What's wrong? Uh, why, do, why, do, why did you read what's read in verse 37 and mine doesn't read that? Well, if you look at your footnote, if you have a footnote, uh, th this is the reason why. It's just not found in Western text, the New King James Version says, including the Latin tradition, uh, that that uh, statement uh, here of Philip <laughs> saying, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And, then the Ethiopian eunuch answering and saying, "I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of uh, the Son of God." Now, I have more to say about it here in just a moment. Move on. Uh, there's a similar example uh, we'll we'll look at here in First John chapter five and verse seven. In First John chapter five and verse seven. And mom, you want to read that this morning? Yes. You think? Okay. 1 John 5 and verse 7. And I don't know what translation mom's reading from. New American Standard. New American Standard, okay. It's going <clears> to <throat> probably won't read the way <clears throat> the uh, King James uh, definitely is going to read on things because uh, you're going to find a thing in that translation, same thing of Acts in chapter 8. Uh, there's a phrase that's missing uh, in most of your later translations. First John five in verse seven. Verse seven. <coughs> and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. All right. Anybody else have a different reading on verse seven? Yeah. Yeah, what you got? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Right. And I'm, what, heck, I'm sorry? What she was reading was, mine has it in verse 6. What you read. Well, how does yours read, Jack, from verse 6 to okay. verse 8? Well, verse 6 is, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. In seven, 
for there are three that testify. Yeah, it stops there on things. Doesn't have, uh, it is a spirit that bears witness, or it doesn't have, uh, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, your translators don't have that. Now again, if you have footnotes, and why you can look off to the side there, and, and my footnote says uh, that some manuscripts omit the words from in heaven through on earth. In other words, they omit the words uh, Verse 7, in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth. In the verse 8, they admit that. Uh, only four or five very late manuscripts contain these words in the Greek. So how are they in four or five, but not in <laughs> maybe 5,000 on things? It appears that some copyists put those words in there. Just cite these two uh, as examples. Uh, they're listed together because of the nature of the evidence is very similar. Both cases, uh, absolutely none of the earliest manuscripts include these passages. Uh, they're both rather transparent attempts by scribes to improve the text to support at that time some orthodox uh, doctrine. Now Acts 8 verse 37, you go back to that, reflects true teaching uh, Jesus did indeed teach that you have to express faith uh, and be baptized uh, for remission of sins to have salvation. There's a whole host of other passages in the book of Acts very clearly, uh, very clearly teach the same uh, thing. But the <coughs> words themselves do not appear in the best of manuscripts. The statement in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, similar uh, on what we call the Trinity. Uh, in the King James Version was added to bolster the biblical view of the Trinity uh, at, that, at that time. It was mainly the Catholic Church that so was uh, wanting the 1611 version uh, to be the authorized version. And uh, so they were shoring up their defenses, if you will, uh, on the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit being the three uh, divine uh, individuals uh, in the Godhead. But the, the actual words only appear as... Uh, my version uh, says in a footnote uh, in four or five uh, particular uh, manuscripts. Uh, so many of the modern English translations just do not include these passages uh, except in marginal notes, except in marginal notes. Now some of you don't have any marginal notes may not even uh, tell you why it's not there on things, uh, but most uh, your translations that you use do have the marginal notes and explain a little bit about what's going on. Uh, this is just one of these categories of what appears to be an intentional variation uh, in the, the manuscripts. Did I see a hand up uh, question or comment on, on this one? Look at uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through 20. And uh, again, we won't read the whole passage <clears throat> Let's see, John, you want to read Mark 16 and verse 9? Because we're going to look at the footnote again, if you have a footnote there. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, mine has a footnote there at verse uh, 9. Uh, verse 9 to 20 are bracketed uh, in uh, some manuscripts as not in the original text. They are lacking in Codex uh, Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, although nearly all other manuscripts of Mark contain them. But you see, the earliest, the most reliable manuscripts do not contain the words from verse 9 through verse 20. Anybody have a translation that uh, ends in verse 8? I've seen some. They don't even have uh, verse 9 through verse 20 uh, in there. They don't remember what the translations are. Now they still will have a footnote and explain why that it's not there, why it ends in verse 8 instead of uh, adding verse 9 to verse 20. And the explanation is just like uh, we explained uh, here. Um, virtually every Greek manuscript, including Alexander, and it does include this passage, though. The problem uh, is that the two exceptions are uh, 
the ones that are universally considered the most authoritative manuscripts, the Sinai and the Vatican copies, uh, are considered the most authoritative manuscripts out there. Uh, and also the oldest version of the Syriac translation New Testament doesn't include Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to verse uh, 20. Uh, the, fin the, the final analysis, uh, the best I determined by those that study in this science of uh, textual criticism, uh, can't really say with absolute certainty whether this passage was in the original Gospel of Mark or not. Uh, scholars say there's just as much evidence for it as there is against it. Those who contend not claim that because the ending of verse 8 seems so abrupt, the early scribes probably felt the necessity to add material about the resurrection to the end of Mark's gospel, not the resurrection, but Jesus teaching and sending his disciples out in all the world. But uh, again, the teaching in these verses exists in other gospel accounts. Uh, there's no doctrinal change. Uh, in what is stated in verse 9 through verse uh, verse 20 of the text. Uh, I've had occasion to um, uh, know uh, years ago uh, fellows that were very studied in uh, New Testament Greek and asked them, I mean, it's just a common question come up among preachers especially, uh, uh, what's your studies? Uh, should it be in there or not be in there? And everyone I've talked to said, well, there's just as much evidence for it as there is without <laughs> uh, not being in there. Uh, it, it is the most controversial of all of the variations that are out there, the best I can tell uh, on it, because some evidence for it, some evidence not for it on things. Questions, comments on Mark 16, verse 9 through 20 here. I think that's the only place, though, that it talks about Jesus throwing devils out of Mary Magdalene, isn't it? Yes, yes. So please. that's the yeah. only place that that's yeah. mentioned. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have one other addition. It's supposed to go after verse 8. Uh, and that's when they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent them to, from east to west, sacred and imperishable proclamation of the eternal oh, salvation. Okay. Yeah. So there's another statement that was, yeah. and it sounds said, like, okay, uh, said, same thing on things. Somebody's yeah. trying to, yeah. okay. it mm -hmm. does not sound like what the writer, Mark, would write. Yeah, right. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. All right. Another uh, one or two uh, to look at Mark chapter 15 and verse 28. <clears throat> Jay, you want to read that for us? Mark 15, verse 28. <clears throat> and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. <clears throat> uh, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include this verse. And you may have a footnote, again my uh, Bible does have a footnote uh, stating that, that, very, uh, that very thing. Uh, it, it's fairly likely that a later scribe added this comment pointing out the fact that Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 53 and verse 12. That's what he is being alluded to here. Now, clearly the meaning of Mark's not changed one way or another by including or excluding this little phrase. Either way, we have Isaiah 53 and verse 12 in our Bibles back in the Old Testament. And it's very clear that Jesus did fulfill this prophecy by what happened to him on the cross uh, here. But again, it's added in one of these 200,000 errors uh, that are out there in the Bible actual critics of the Bible will say, well, you know, we can't trust what the Bible says because of all these errors on things. And that's why I've said before, you, there are variations in readings, but not technically errors, as we would think uh, of uh, errors being something that would change doctrine in one way or another or make the text un, unreliable. And then another one, John chapter 19 and verse uh, 14. John 19, verse 14, and again we'll look at uh, the, the fact that there is a footnote on this passage. You want to read that for us, Mary? <clears throat> and it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour, and he saith to the Jews, Behold your king. And uh, this one uh, may not be as obvious. Uh, my, mine doesn't even have a footnote uh, regarding any kind of a textual problem uh, here. But <clears throat> there are some manuscripts that read instead of the sixth hour, 
the third hour. Uh, and it, it, it indicates that uh, there was an attempt to correct what the scribe at the time considered to be inaccuracy. inaccuracy. The copyist wanted uh, John 19 verse 14 to conform to what Mark's account says in Mark chapter 15 verse 25 as the third hour. But he didn't notice the fact that the reference is made to two different events. Uh, Mark chapter 15 verse 25 does say the third hour, but it's a different time than what is happening in John 19 verse 14. But some manuscripts do have, instead of the sixth hour, the third hour. Minor, minor, but it is referred to as an intentional uh, error in these, in these manuscripts. And there's a couple more uh, that are even, more, uh, even less significant uh, that we could mention. But virtually that's it. Uh, of, of the five examples we've listed, only one is actually considered controversial, and that's Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through verse 20 that we stated uh, about earlier. Questions or comments on uh, these uh, various uh, differences, uh, unintentional and intentional errors? Yeah, now I may mention yeah last uh, last week that uh, there are variations in the Old Testament on things, but since there are very few manuscripts, about 700, some say as many as 1,700 manuscripts, the variations are small also on things, and most time uh, we don't concern ourselves so much with them. But of course, textual critics that are studying it would uh, concern themselves with variations too in the Old Testament uh, text, but they all come under the same kind of categories, uh, some intentional, some unintentional, and they're all uh, boiled down to not changing any doctrinal teaching of the Old Testament also. If that answers your question on things, these are all New, New Testament examples we focused on. Uh, you don't have this on your outline, I intended, <laughs> at least for the question to be on the outline, but somehow or another somebody made a mistake and it didn't get on there. <clears throat> How? significant are these textual variations. And what I have here, uh, just some quotations from uh, some of these uh, students in the science of textual criticism, what they say uh, about these uh, various uh, textual differences. Uh, when all the variants of all the manuscripts are accounted for, as I stated, the, the number of variants in the New Testament text is some 200,000. So how sure can we be that our biblical text hasn't been corrupted like those that actually criticize the Bible, no any faith in uh, what we have in God's Word and are trying to contend? Well, the answer is that the vast majority of variants are very minor and affect, uh, in, in only a very few cases, the meaning of a text, as we've uh, noted in our studies. Many of the variations of no more importance than the failure to uh, dot an I or cross a T, as we would say in our English uh, language. Uh, none of the variants have an impact on any major doctrine of uh, Scripture. Uh, quote, uh, first of all, from uh, Westcott and uh, Hort. Uh, uh, these were uh, noted as very excellent textual critics. Uh, they believe that only one sixtieth of the variants in the New Testament rise above the level of trivialities or could be called substantial variations. Uh, even uh, before the more recent manuscript findings, this would amount to the, a text that is 98.33% pure. Uh, Dr. Hort, quotation him, with regard to the great bulk of the words of the New Testament, as of most other ancient writings, there's no variation or other ground of doubt and therefore no room for textual criticism. The amount of what can in any sense be called substantial variation is but a small fraction of the whole residuary variation and can hardly form more than a thousandth part of the entire text, uh, as his studies in the matter. Uh, Dr. Ezra Abbott, uh, he was the foremost uh, textual scholar in America uh, in the early 1800s, uh, and he was a member of one of these revision committees uh, revising uh, some of these versions. Uh, he said that about 1920th of the various readings have so little weight uh, that all they, they are various readings, no one would think of them as rival readings. And he states that the remainder are so little importance 
that their adoption or rejection would make no appreciable difference in the sense of a passage where they occur. Uh, according to Abbott's estimates, uh, the text is 99.75% pure. Uh, Philip Sheff, we may know of more of him uh, writing uh, the history of the Christian uh, church, uh, but he also has uh, writings in this field of study, textual criticism. Uh, and uh, he states that of the 150,000 variations, that's how many were known in the 1800s, 150,000 variations, he says only about 400 affect the sense. And of those 400, only about 50 are of real significance for one reason or another. But not one of these 50 affect an article of faith or precept of duty which is not abundantly sustained by other and undoubted passages or by the whole tenor of Scripture uh, teaching. Uh, this is in his introduction to the New Testament, uh, original Greek <clears throat> version. And then A.T. Robertson, he's uh, also a noted authority in uh, Greek uh, studies. Uh, he believed that only a thousandth part of the entire text was of any real concern. That would make the New Testament 99.9 percent .9 free from real concern for the textual critic. Uh, Robertson, uh, in his uh, work, Introduction to Textual Criticism, says the real conflict in the textual criticism of the New Testament is concerning this thousandth part of the entire text. So you're not really talking about 200,000 supposed errors out there, just a thousandth part of the entire uh, text. And then uh, just a couple of others I don't have up there. Uh, Warfield, uh, uh, quoting him, the great mass New Testament has been transmitted to us with no or next to no variations. And then a Sir Frederick uh, Kenyon noted in this field of study, the Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation, he holds in it the true word of God handed down with essential, without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. Questions or comments on our studies of uh, these various textual uh, variations uh, that are indeed out there, uh, but uh, those that are well versed in the studies uh, contend that they're of no consequence, especially in regard to uh, doctrinal teaching. Uh, next week, uh, going to begin uh, the last part of our study in this series of the origin of the Bible, the history of the English Bible. And uh, probably spend a couple weeks on this and what I have been generally doing when we get down to the end of a study, asking the class and if you have a preference of what to study next. And uh, I do remember uh, one student asked for one study, and I can run that by you, and I don't know whether Pat's still interested in studying the kingdom of God or not. The kingdom of God? I'm open. Okay, you've been studying, I think, a book by Billy Moore on things. And I, I don't know how to say it. I always have an aversion to a text, uh, a... Uh, class workbook, I guess, on things. That's what it, but I don't mind. I, I went ahead and, I used to have a copy, but I didn't have one. I went ahead and bought one, and I think he's got a very good study on things, and if uh, the class wants to look at the subject, and it's a, a very good uh, subject matter to look at, uh, the, the Kingdom of God, uh, this uh, workbook covers it very well, and I uh, don't mind walking through it for the next uh, few months on things. If you have other preferences, uh, well, we can, I mean, I've talked about before, I've got uh, entire studies on prayer uh, that we have in the Bible, the parables, parables of Jesus in particular, uh, New Testament books, Old Testament books. Uh, be thinking about it. Uh, the uh, next few weeks, you can come to me personally, or you can state a preference in the class here, and we'll look at what uh, everybody would kind of like to look at. I know that we can't usually pick out a subject that everybody agrees on, uh, but at least one that, uh, that a good bit would like to look at and uh, uh, be satisfied with uh, before we move on to something else in time. Uh, thank you for your attention here this morning, and uh, I know that we're... Uh, hadn't, hadn't been a second one yet, has there? On things, but I know it's about ready on things. Yeah, the textual variation, it's a slide. Yep, there's a second one.
I've had a text yeah. variation. The, this one was Ann, but on your slide it was okay. Ann. Okay.
help things to be in the afterlife, things of that nature. Well, it's I know some people say that there's a, the there's a prejudgment because if you yeah. if you die, then you go to either purgatory or Hades yeah. and wait for yeah. for judgment. Yeah. Well, that would be a prejudgment yeah. the way they're reading it. Yeah. 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 And it's hard to discuss something like that with somebody that's got that stuck in their head. That's it. That's right. Yeah, definitely so.